We are in a series entitled, The Pursuit of Happiness. Sociologists and researchers have been studying Americans' happiness for the last 50 years. And I have good news and bad news. The good news is you can change the state of your happiness. The bad news is we are at an all-time low in our country. There has never been a time in the last 50 years where people are more unhappy than they are today. Our happiness level is just going down. And you say, well, I know, Pastor, it's because of the pandemic. Sorry, it was, it was declining way before the pandemic. There's a problem in our nation. The more that we pursue happiness, the more that we chase after happiness, the more elusive it becomes. And so I believe that we have to stop chasing happiness the way that our culture tells us, and we need to look at what Jesus has to say about happiness. The most important message or the most recognized historic message that Jesus preached was a message called the Sermon on the Mount. He preached it to a group of disciples as he sat on a mount. I've been there in Israel, the place they say that it happened. And he started every sentence of this message by the word blessed. In the Greek, that word is makarios. It means happy, blissful, content. So this message that we call the Beatitudes is all about really what it means to be happy God's way. Not the world's way, but God's way. One of the sentences that I'm going to focus on today is a sentence in the middle of the message where he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will, become, they will be called sons and daughters of God. So I'm going to talk to you about the habits of peacemakers. There are some of you today that the reason that you are utterly unhappy is because you have not embraced what it means to be a peacemaker in your relationships. That you are at odds and in conflict and in disagreement and constant tension with most of the people that are around you. And it's easy for us to blame people, to say that people are ignorant, insensitive, rude, self-centered, but a lot of us have not understood or embraced what it means to be a peacemaker like Jesus said. So if you could take your notes, I want you to write this down. I'm going to focus on about five habits of peacemakers. Habit number one, peacemakers empathize with people's emotions. Notice what it says in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is talking and he describes what it means to get along with people. He describes what it means to be a peacemaker and to live in harmony with people around us. I'm going to begin reading in verse 15 of Romans chapter 12. It says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to revenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, 
but overcome evil with good. Five habits of peacemakers. Habit number one. Peacemakers empathize with people's emotions. It says rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. If you're going to be a peacemaker, if you're going to solve conflicts in your relationships, if you're going to be a peace broker in your family, you will have to develop the skill of empathy. Now, there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. Empathy is defined in the dictionary as the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experiences of another person. The difference between empathy and sympathy has been described this way. Someone said sympathy is if you walk by a big hole in the ground and see a friend down there, you see, oh, that's bad. Oh, that's really bad that you're down there. That's sympathy. Empathy is walking by, getting down into the hole with them, and saying to them, that you understand what they're going through and this is a terrible situation and you feel their pain. That's empathy. Let me tell you something about this. This is a biblical concept, the concept of empathy. Uh, rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn. Uh, men, can I pick on you for a second? All the wives say amen. It's Mother's Day next week. Don't worry, I'm going to pick on you moms. Uh, so let me tell you, I talk to men all the time who have a difficult time empathizing because as men oftentimes they're taught, don't show emotion, be tough emotionally, and uh, just kind of suck it up. And so when their wife comes to them brokenhearted and says, I just can't, I'm, uh, what's wrong, honey? I talked to this cousin and the, the word she said to me and how she said it, it's really hurting me. And the husband goes in and says, well, show me your phone. Gives your phone. I'm going to block her right now. If there's caller ID, don't pick up. You know, next time she tells you something, this is what you need to tell her back. And you wonder why she runs to her room and cries in her pillow by herself and says, you just made it worse. And you say, what? I just solved the problem. No. You gave her a solution. She wasn't asking for a solution. She was asking for empathy. Empathy is, I'm feel bad that you feel this way. I'm sorry that you're hurt. I can imagine that that was very difficult. Man, that's hard for us men to say, right? And, and empathizing with the emotion because what you're telling, first of all, before I give you a solution, I understand that this is painful. Now, I know some men in this place say, well, pastor, it's just God, God's not wired me that way. I'm just not an empathetic guy. And yet I saw you cry at a Bears game. You see, it all depends on our, what the situation is. And regardless of how you are wired in your personality, if you are going to be a peacemaker, you have to engage in the ability, in the ability to empathize with people's feelings. Not just what is right or wrong, but how people are feeling in a given determined circumstance. To be a peacemaker, you're going to have to enter into someone's pain a little bit, get outside of your world, and understand why they're feeling happy and why they're feeling sad or going through a difficult time. Blessed are the peacemakers. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love one another. Number two, habit number two. By the way... Jesus, who was the Messiah, all God, knew all things. I'm always touched by the shortest verse in the Bible. You know what the shortest verse in the Bible is? Jesus wept. And he wept at the funeral of a good friend that he was about to resurrect. He knew that he was about to raise him from the dead. But when he saw his sisters weeping 
over the death of their brother, even though he knew he was going to resurrect them, he empathized with them. And the Bible says that he didn't just shed a tear, but he convulsed in weeping. He wept from a deep place as he saw people that he loved experiencing pain. Number two, peacemakers do not embrace a spirit of pride or prejudice. Verse 16 says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low positions. Do not be conceited. Live in harmony with one another. You know, sometimes we think that to get along, we have to agree on everything. But that's not true. Harmony, actually, is two different distinct sounds that actually flow together and can um, make a great sound together even though they're very distinct. That's harmony. Harmony is the ability to say, I don't fully agree with you, but I have the ability to respect you as an individual, as someone created in the image of God, and so I don't have to fully agree with you to get along or work beside you. That's harmony. Uh, Harmony... The Bible says, so he's talking, by the way, not just to believers that are all Christ followers, because earlier in the passage he says, when people persecute you, this is how you are to deal with them. So these are believers and non-believers. He said, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Can I tell you something here today? Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10 says, where there is strife, there is pride. Show me a place where there's a lot of strife, where there's a lot of fighting, and I'll show you someone in that equation that has a lot of pride. Hello? Show me a place where there's a lot of bickering, a lot of fighting, a lot of inability to really resolve the conflict, and I'll show you that somewhere in that mix, there is someone that is proudful. Because pride basically says, I'm right, they're wrong. And I want to make sure they know they're wrong. And I want to make sure that I don't have to apologize or humble myself or admit that I'm wrong. And so I'm going to go over and over the fact that they're wrong. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to build an argument. I'm going to spend whatever time I need to because I want them to say they were wrong and I was right. So I will argue. I'll spend three, four hours arguing my point, building up a case. And sometimes we get very good at verbal sparring just to try to bend their knee in our argument until they say uncle, and then we say, aha. Can I, can I tell you something? Sometimes you can win the argument and lose a relationship. Because sometimes you just need to say, I understand where you're coming from. I disagree with you. But I wouldn't approach it that way. But pride can't say that. Pride has to insist on humbling the other person, on trying to get the other person to say that they were wrong. That's a spirit of pride. And here's what the Bible says. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but, we, but be willing to associate with people of low position and do not be conceited. You see, pride not only wants to make sure that other people know they're wrong, but pride also does not want to associate with people that they feel are beneath them. And so blessed are the peacemakers. What do peacemakers do? Pe- peacemakers are not focused on people's social status. They don't look at people's economy. They don't judge people by their accent. They don't stereotype people by their skin color, by what side of the street they grew up on, by what side of Chicago they grew up on. They do not categorize people that way. They do not disassociate with people that they feel like, oh, you're in a category beneath me because they are free from pride. And when they're free from pride, they don't have to elevate their esteem by only associating with people that they feel are at their level or their class. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called 
sons of God. You know, they did a study at the University of Illinois and um, did it among college students. And uh, they discovered that 10% of the students with the highest scores recorded in the survey of personal happiness, they discovered what they had in common. What they had in common was not their economic status, was not their skin color, was not what background they came from. What they had in common was this. The 10% of students that were happiest, they had strong ties to their friends and family and commitment to spending time with them. Let me say that again. They've done a lot of studies throughout our country and they realized that really your happiness does not depend on the money that you make. I know some of you think that if you made double what you make right now, you would be a happy camper. You say, well, at least I'd like to try it, Pastor. I get it. I get it. But can I be honest with you? The research does not show that. In fact, they did a, they've done research on people that won the lottery and realized that the level of happiness between people that won the lottery and people that did not win the lottery, there's no significant difference. They've also done happiness studies on people that make a lot of money and people that make a lot less, less money. And there is no variable in the research indicating that money makes you any happier in life. The variable that does indicate that people are happier, listen, are people that are able to develop a community of friends, that are able to engage with family, that are able to work through conflict and not push people away, and that are able to establish a community of people in which they are vulnerable and open with, and they are able to hang out with and spend time together. In other words, people that learn to get along with other people are the happiest on the face of this earth. This is not... This is not just what the Bible says. This is what research out there, extra biblical, secular research is telling us. And the Bible had told, that, told us that a long time ago. Blessed are the peacemakers. Happy are those that have learned the art and the power of making peace in their relationships. Number three, I'm talking about the habits of peacemakers. Peacemakers initiate reconciliation in their relationships. Notice what it tells us in verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. A better translation, I think, is the ESV that says, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. This is not being a people pleaser and trying to please everybody, but this is being conscious of what you do and how it affects other people. Are you with me here? There's a difference between being a people pleaser, I'm always trying to do everything so that people are happy with me, and doing things in a way that you realize what I do affects other people and I want to honor other people and make sure that I'm not deliberately or indeliberately offending them. So... It says, if possible, verse 18, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Can I tell you something? Peacemakers initiate peace. <laughs> Let me tell you what that means. That means that if you are in a situation where you know that someone is angry at you, there's an unresolved conflict with you, that it's easy for you to say in your heart, well, they got the problem, they should come to me. But peacemakers initiate peace. They have a humility that says, hey, do we need to talk about this? Peacemakers, they don't just love peace. The Bible doesn't say, blessed are the people that love peace. We all love peace. But very few of us are willing to engage in peacemaking. 
Do you understand the difference? Some of you on your way to church here, you're in a house full of people fighting for the bathroom. It's chaos, and, the, and someone in the house says, I just want a little peace. Have you ever said that, parents? All I want is a little peace and quiet. One young mother was telling me that sometimes she just goes in the bathroom and closes the door because it's the only place that she can get a little peace and quiet. I just want a little peace and quiet in my house. We all love peace and quiet. That's why we like vacations because you get away from everything and it's peace and quiet. So it doesn't say blessed are the people that love peace. Blessed are the peacemakers because to make peace involves work. It involves initiative. It involves stepping into thorny situations. It involves people that are in conflict, people that are angry, people that are not getting along, people that, hurt fe- that have hurt feelings. And so peacemaking sometimes means that you engage in relational reconciliation with people that are angry at you, but it also means that you have the initiative to step into situations that may be around you, close to you in your family, and say, hey, can I broker this? I see that you guys aren't talking. Can we, do we need to kind of bring you two together? Can we talk about this? Blessed are the peacemakers. You are working towards restoring peace. Let me, let me be honest with you. Some, some of you are not peacemakers. You are, you are conflict agitators. You know who I'm talking about. You're not like, yeah, I know. She probably didn't mean it that way. Why don't we sit down and talk, clarify this. Some of you are like, she said that to you? Well, girl, I wouldn't take that. I would tell her back that. You need to call her up and tell her this. And you know what you are? If I were in your place, man, you're taking that. Girl, I would. I, you are conflict agitators. Not peace brokers. And can I tell you the honest truth? There are some of you in this auditorium that probably have family members that you haven't spoken to in five, six, or seven years because of some conflict that happened. And I'm a pastor that's done a lot of funerals. Invariably at funerals, there'll be someone at a casket weeping loudly, very grieved, and oftentimes telling the person that's laid out in that casket things that they should have told them five years ago. They're apologizing, I should have told you, I'm sorry we didn't, I did this. Hey, that speech should have happened two, three, four, five years ago. Why are you waiting till they're gone to express how much they meant and the appreciation? I lived in a village, I grew up in Spain and lived in a village of 200 people and I remember my father talking to a man and a woman who were up there in age living in the same village of 200 people. They hadn't spoken to each other in 25 years. In a village of 200 people because they had a disagreement over inheritance money. And when all is said and done, blessed are those that initiate the process of brokering peace, that step into conflict. And this is what he says, so if possible. Now, it's not always possible. Sometimes you try to extend an olive branch and the person slaps it out of your hand. Sometimes you say, okay, can we talk? And they don't respond. I've had situations where I've reached out to people and they don't want to talk, they don't want to, and so I give them space. And sometimes you have to give give them space. Sometimes people choose to be angry, hateful, and bitter at you. But at least it should be on their side, not on yours. Number four. Not only do they initiate reconciliation, by the way, Romans chapter 14, verse 19 says, so then when we pursue the things, so then we pursue the things that make for peace and building one another up. We pursue the things that make for peace. All right, number four, peacemakers trust God to bring justice to situations. You say, well, pastor, you don't understand. This person really did me wrong. They lied to me. They, they really did me wrong. 
And so I want to have nothing to do with that person. In fact, I'm, I'm, I, you know, every time I see them, I think they need to pay for what they've done. And, you know, and, and so I, I stalk them on social media, and I see who their friends are, and I watch them. Have you ever noticed that when you get angry at someone, when you're really, you try to, you don't want them to know that you've clicked on their profile, but you're stalking them, you're watching them. Oh, oh, they're listening, they're talking to that person. They just knew who they were talking to. And you just become obsessed. Let me tell you something. Here's what scripture says. Look at this. Look at this. Trust God to bring justice to situations. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Leave room for God's wrath. This means don't take it into your own hands. Every person on the face of this earth will stand before the judge. We will all give account for our actions, and you are not the judge. And you can spend your life trying to make someone pay for something that, you know what, God's going to make them pay for it anyways. You just need to say, God, I'm going to put this in your hands. I'm not going to try to bring about vengeance on mine. I'm not going to try to get, maybe justice hasn't happened, but God, I'm saying that you are the God of the universe. You are sovereign. And so I'm going to put it into your hands to bring justice in this situation. Part of what we have to do in an unjust world is leave some things up to the sovereignty of God. Amen? I've never seen good come out of people that take vengeance into their own hands. Unfortunately, we live in the city of Chicago. We've had to have funerals outside of the city because of concern over retaliation, sometimes of this group versus that group. And it's this perpetual cycle of vengeance this per perpetual cycle of trying to get even that never satisfies either part. There's a process and a power when someone says, I know this person, it feels like they got away with it, but God, I'm entrusting it into your hands. You do justice where I can't, God, and I'm allowing room for the justice of God. And, number, and, and lastly, I believe it's number six, Peacemakers overcome evil with goodness. Now, this is going to blow your mind. This is so countercultural. This is not what you want to hear, but this is Jesus style. Jesus said it, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about those that persecute us and he talks about our enemies. Paul is repeating it in Romans chapter 12. He's giving the same essence. He says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, laugh at him and say, ah, <laughs> you got what you deserve. You're hungry now, huh? Well, I hope you eat dirt. This is what he says. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Feed him? If he's thirsty, Give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. The very opposite of what they expect. That you would beat them while they're down. That you would take advantage of them and laugh at them while they're down. The very opposite, he says, is the heart and compassion of people that are followers of Jesus that we understand that a lot of people do what they do because they're broken. A lot of people do what they do because they're in darkness. And we understand that we were like that too. Many of us did the same things before we came to God. And so instead, we do what is absolutely unexpected. We do good to those that have not been good to us. We show acts of kindness to those that don't deserve it. Why? Because we're sons and daughters of the Most High God. And while we were yet sinners, he loved us. And when we didn't deserve it, he showed compassion to us. And he touched us and loved us and redeemed us. And so we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And so therefore we operate in a way that is commensurate with the God that we serve. 
Even the world out there does kindness to those that show kindness to them. People are nice to people that are nice to them. People smile at people that smile back to them. People show grace to people that show grace to them. But when people show kindness to those that are rude, when people act graciously, when others are acting ungraciously, that causes people to say, what's up with that person? Something must be, why are they doing that? Because they're sons and daughters of the most high living God. Because the spirit of God lives inside of us. I've seen people in this auditorium that on the streets were battling each other in other days. And I've witnessed with my eyes people that hated each other on the streets. And when someone walks in broken and a brother has been here for a long time, their life is cleaned up, they know Jesus, I've seen them be the first that go and says, hi, the guy, I don't know, you went to this church. Hi, man, I'm so glad you're here and give him a hug. Man, that's the power of redemption. It's the power of forgiveness. It's, it's how people know that we're sons and daughters of the Most High God. 